Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to all of you today. Uh, today is a very special occasion for the City of Pine Bluff and the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff and the Arts and Science Center. Uh, I would like to welcome you to Pine Bluff, Arkansas uh, for our African American exhibit. Today we have a panelist here, Africova artist, and today I will serve as your moderator and I will pose questions to you and then we will uh, complete a dialogue uh, going back and forth. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming, for Kevin Cole, Nessa Stevens, Achille Ron Anderson, Napoleon John Henderson, and Adrian Cowens. We really appreciate you guys coming to Arkansas and to really share this special moment with us. We believe here that we are creating history and to our guests who are uh, in support of this and with us today. I will address a few questions, and the questions are already outlined. And the first question would be, we will talk about the state of Africa, its longevity and its survivorship, economics and empowerment in terms of Africa, and the aesthetic and social impact of Africa in American society. The first thing I would like for you to do is just kind of give us a brief overview. Just tell us who you are and tell us a little bit about yourself. Kevin Cole. Um, I'm from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. I did my undergraduate here at the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. I have a master's in art education from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana and a master's of fine arts and drawing from Northern Illinois University. Uh, I've been teaching in, the, in Atlanta for 32 years. Uh, I'm currently in the, in the art department at, at Westlake High School. I'm also an uh, AP art consultant for SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design in Atlanta and Hong Kong. Thank you. My name is Nelson Stevens. Um, I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York, um, and joined Africa in Chicago in 1969. The organization has been in existence 48 years this year. Um, two years from now would be 50 years old. And, but the inception of Africobra is the Wall of Respect in Chicago uh, in 67. And I do remember going, I t and I've taught at the University of Massachusetts Amherst for the last 35 years. I'm Professor Emeritus from there. That means we left on good terms. <laughs> I had to explain it to my parents. Like I had to explain tenure. My father said, what's tenure? So I said, it's like a union card paid up. <laughs> he understood. So I was doing OK. Um, I'm a muralist primarily. And my chief mural, major mural, uh, after doing a lot of them in Springfield, Massachusetts, with my students is at Tuskegee, in Tuskegee, Alabama. It is called the University of Tuskegee now. It was Tuskegee Institute for 100 years. And um, I have a great mural there. If you get a chance to go, check it out. You'll enjoy it. It's in the President's Building. OK. Thank you. Yes, greetings. Uh, Akili Ron Anderson here. Uh, I'm presently at Howard University, assistant professor teaching painting, drawing, 3D concepts, uh, advanced drawing, and just life to youngsters who are striving to become art practitioners. I uh, am living, uh, well, I'm Howard, of course, is in Washington, D.C. I uh, was born in Washington, D.C., and uh, been there all my life. Uh, we'll be all, there all my life, probably, the way it's looking now at 70. So, <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm, I'm uh, uh, beg your pardon? My little brother. Okay, yeah, yes, yeah, correct. This is my mentor uh, here. Uh, so, uh, been with Africa Cobra since 1980. Africa uh through the leadership of Jeff Donaldson, came to uh, Howard University to hit his art department during that time, and he uh, invited me into the organization 
and actually gave me a one-man show in the gallery too, now that I think about it. Uh, so that I couldn't refuse that offer. Uh, and uh, we celebrate his name. We celebrate the name of uh, Dutopia Hayes Benjamin, who uh, for years was the uh, dean. Uh, and also, uh, we were fellow students. She is legendary. Both, are, I might add, as ancestors, and we call upon them uh, today and uh, all days, as well as our parents. Akilah, let, me, let me stop you just for one okay. second. Tell, tell us a little bit about uh, the start of the Alpha Cobra, and tell us about Jeff Donaldson. We have young people in here who had never met uh, Dr. Donaldson before. Mm -hmm. Tell us something that we don't know about him. Well, what I would do is uh, I'll, I'll say a couple words, but pass that on to the next person, Napoleon, who is one of the founders, as, as is uh, 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 Nelson here, but I will say he is a giant. He walked in long strides, he was very tall, uh, very brown, and very uh, direct, and sometimes confrontational. All right, and what we say, at least what I say, is that an organization like ours, like Howard University at the time in particular, like the 60s in that age, needed a lion. Needed a lion, needed somebody who uh, you know, some people say walk softly and carry a big stick. He carried a big stick and walked unsoftly. Okay, <laughs> so it was uh, quite an inspiration to uh, to uh, as as a young person at the time. Uh, uh, you know, I guess uh, he was maybe closer to my age now, but to get that kind of leadership. Uh, coming out of Chicago, that movement being legendary, the people being legendary, even the people who were short looked like they were tall. Okay, <laughs> it was that kind of a reputation that they carried with them. So, uh, you know, and then there's such a great scholar. Now, see, you know, all of us uh, have gone into scholarship. It seems as though he was born into it. Uh, he was a very smart man. And uh, he was very, uh, very uh, uh, black very Afrocentric, African-centered, however you want to put it, beg your pardon? Pan-African. Pan-African, and uh, look, look that up, uh, whoever hears this, uh, look up nationalism and black nationalism and Pan-Africanism and understand the history because we feel, or at least particularly I'm preaching the feeling that we're in a 50-year cycle. Mm -hmm. And during the time when Africa Cobra was uh, started, we're about 50 years out, as was mentioned, we're at 48 on the countdown here. And we are predicting that that cycle is going to repeat itself. So as you know, as all the people in the room are studied people, as historians, when you look back 50 years, it's going to repeat itself, then you can pretty much predict the future. Not okay. uh, as a matter of fact, every, every particular point, but you can be knowledgeable about what decisions to make because you understand the cycles of history. So, you know, just to answer your question, a great inspiration. As a teacher, I'm hoping to give that to the, the young people that pass by my room or in my room or in the hallway or whatever contact I have with them. Uh, as young black people, as young artists, uh, we call, uh, you know, the university is HBCUs. Uh, we, I just say it's a black school. You know, it's designed and forever, hopefully, will be designed to celebrate our culture because there's never a point where we won't need our own institutions to, uh, you know, to highlight the needs of our people and to uh, move us forward. So I'm, uh, be, before I go too long here, uh, I, I, will, I will pass the microphone over to my brother here and allow him to. No, uh, I'll start with this one. That one's a little too hot. Okay. Right, that, that's okay. too hot for me. Uh, Napoleon Jones Henderson. Um, I was born and raised in Chicago. Uh, my mother's from Bessemer, Alabama, right outside of Birmingham. Because when the people say, where are you from? She say, Birmingham. Nobody knows where Bessemer is. Yeah. Uh, my dad is from Yazoo, Mississippi, Yazoo City. And I have a grandmother from my daddy's father who is from Little Rock, Arkansas. And Jeff being from Pine Bluff, and really the circle is extraordinarily interesting in terms of my life in Arkansas as a state, and Pine Bluff in particular, because Helen Joyner, Joyner, J-O-Y-N-E-R, was a young black woman who had graduated from here and came to Chicago to teach at the high school that I attended, which was uh, my connection back to uh, Talladega, I mean Tuskegee, Alabama, was George Washington Carver High School. And she was my art teacher. She became my mentor 
and uh, a very personal friend. And so having her in my life in high school and meeting Jeff when I was out of high school uh, was a full circle in terms of Arkansas and Pine Bluff as a, as a place to find uh, guidance within the framework which brings me here today without those two persons um, mm -hmm. being a part of that journey. But uh, I grew up in Chicago, graduated from George Washington Carver High School, uh, attended, went, graduated from the Art Institute of Chicago, studied at Northern Illinois University by way of getting connected there through Nelson Stevens, uh, studying with uh, Mahboub Shazaman, an uh, extraordinarily gifted and beautiful woman who was a weaver from Pakistan and uh, finished not too long ago in 2005 I went back to uh, MICA uh, to get a MFA. Uh, it doesn't hurt to know the Dean but it also <laughs> doesn't hurt that they had just uh, built an extraordinarily new com com uh, a facility dealing with the uh, film and video and all that media so I wanted to extend my practice so I decided to go back there and get an MFA and other good buddies of mine who thought I was too old to do that decided they'd go back and do some of that stuff too. You're never too old. Uh, but Jeff became, just like Helen did, very much a part of Chicago because their sense of activism and affirmation of themselves and ourselves as a people rooted in the cotton and the rice fields here of Arkansas uh, became fertile uh, beyond, I guess, maybe even their own imaginations in the soil of up south Chicago. And so they fit in Chicago just as if they had been born in Chicago as I was born in Chicago. And Africober, uh, the Association for the Advancement of the Creative Musicians, uh, Kaumba Workshop, uh, Darlene Blackburn and her dancers, Phil Coran, and uh, EPA, we can just name a whole litany of institutions that came out of that energy of Africans from the South, Deep South, coming up South to Chicago. I mean, Hoyt Fuller and the uh, uh, energies of people like Gwendolyn Brooks and Margaret Burroughs okay. and Haki Matibuti and, you Murray know, the Murray the Pillars, of course, yes, Murray the Pillars. I mean, we had a wellspring in Chicago that was fertilized by, I guess you would say it was a convergence of coming up the Mississippi to Chicago, because we just went from down south up south. Mm -hmm. And that kind of energy was just something that, uh, as I say, growing up in Chicago, you had to make a decision not to be an activist or not to be a race man or a race woman, because that was just how you were raised which is the same way you were raised here. You just could express it slightly differently up south than down south. And my principal medium is a weaving. I'm a textile weaver. I weave tapestries and anything in textiles from braiding hair. My two daughters were glad when they got to be uh, in high school I didn't have to braid their hair anymore. <laughs> and so was I. Uh, but uh, anything in textiles, quilt making, you name it, if it's in textiles, I do it from uh, spinning yarn to all the rest. But I'm a printmaker and enamelist, and that's uh, principally uh, ancient techniques coming all the way back from ancient Egypt, coming forward, uh, fusing glass to metal. Okay. And uh, being in front of those hot furnaces, I guess that's why I keep this slim form here. But uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to give this over to Thank Edgar, so my brother. Um, my name is Adrick Cowens. Uh, I was born and raised in Columbus, Ohio. I grew up at a time um, toward the end of the Second World War, and I grew up in a very rich family uh, in terms of love and understanding. My mother was an amateur photographer. My uncle was an amateur photographer. So I had photography around me and music all the time. I saw uh, Paul Robeson when I was a kid, I saw Marian Anderson when I was a kid, I saw a lot of things. So I grew up being proud and black. You know, my mother used to tell me, don't walk with your head down, hold your head up. So uh, as I grew in, in life and uh, began to understand things, I went to Ohio University and graduated from there with a degree in photography. Um, but as a kid, my mother always sent me down to the local museum to do finger painting when I was a kid and I enjoyed that but anyway 
coming forward. Uh, I studied at OU. I left there and I came to New York. I worked with Gordon Parks at Life Magazine, uh, and then I went on from there to form my own studio and open my own place. I worked in the movie business for many years, doing stills on movies, uh, The Eyes of Laura Mars on Golden Pond, Dirty Dancing, The Cotton Club, about 40 feature films I worked on. In 1979, um, I met the Afro-Cobra artists, and I wanted to be part of them. I met Nelson in 1977 in Nigeria. And I showed him a painting. He said, whoa, what's that shiny? <laughs> so, and everybody knew me as a photographer, but I painted very quietly because it was something that's very personal to me to deal with paint. So I wasn't really out there as an artist in, uh, in terms of painting, but as in photography I was. I was one of the founding members of a group called the Kamonge Group which we just recently had our book published this year. It's called Timeless, it's 398 pages. It's a beautiful book. But we formed around the same time that Afro-Cobra formed because we had the same ideas and concepts that so we were tired of being pictured by white people's concepts of us. We wanted to show black people proud, the good parts of our race, and so we formed in 1968, and this was, is our first book. So when I met Nelson and James Phillips, I said, I really like you guys because you define your own destiny. It's something that I've always been important to me to do, to not wait for somebody else to define something for you, but they would define their own destiny. So I became a member in 1979, and I met Jeff, who was a very powerful they are under speaking about Jeff. <laughs> Jeff was big, you know, in size. Almost seven feet tall. Almost seven feet tall. Voice he was real deep. Hmm? Voice was deep. Yeah. His voice was deep. He had been an extra in a couple of movies. Uh, so he was a very handsome man. But Jeff was very, very disciplined in terms of his work and discipline in terms of his concepts of Afrocentric and Pan-Africanism to the point that a lot of people, you know, got really, couldn't stand him. We were ahead of the curve in terms of defining our own destiny and having respect for us as a people and using that power to do something, you know, to help ourselves, you know. So anyway, I am, uh, got into the group and we started having shows and exhibitions all over. Then it became a cross between photography and painting and photography and painting. Mm -hmm. But I think that the main thing that came out of me being part of uh, Africa was the family. The idea that we stuck together and supported each other and uh, love. It's this, uh, the greatest feeling in the world and I'm proud to be part of this group. I'd like to emphasize Jeff Donaldson again. Uh, when we first had our largest, uh, ex first large exhibit in New York at the Studio Museum, what we did was give a ballot to people. And we asked them if you, we had 10 in the, in the group at the time. 10 in Search of a Nation was the name of the exhibit. Nation time. Um, it was the time when anybody asked you what time it was, it was always the same time. Nation time. Nation time. <laughs> Nation time. <laughs> no matter what time. No matter what time it was. At, at any rate, we gave them a ballot, and we said, if you could afford it, please choose the one you would like to have. We took the ballots back to Chicago. This is Jeff's idea. And we made silk screen prints of each one of the most popular of everyone in the organization. So that when we came back the next year, we could sell for $10 silk screen prints to people who bought it for $10. And we showed them how to frame it almost free with saran wrap and paper bags. Mm -hmm. A hook on the paper bag, right? Jeff's idea. So we organized and supported our organization, not from grants, but from ourselves. We didn't have to compromise with anybody for anything. Um, 
another of Jeff's ideas. I ran into him at a college art association mm -hmm. conference. I'm looking for a job. He looks at my slides, I'm looking at his slides, and I realize that I'm talking to the guy who organized the Wall of Respect in Chicago in 67. And he says to me, if you can get as close, get as close to Chicago as possible for your job, because I'd like to see you in Africa. Mm -hmm. Well, I got a job an hour outside because of him, because of him suggesting. But in 1969, we were hot. We were hot. You could get a job. Yes. <laughs> you know? <laughs> we had earned respect. You could get a job. Um, Jeff Donaldson is the titular head of the organization. He has passed, and he passed on a very interesting day. He passed on February 29th. Mm -hmm. And what's the significance of that? It only comes around once every four years. I think he planned it. I think he planned it. Um, it would be like him to do that. He would. Um, he did because wow. I, I can I can I can say this, which is uh, quite personal. But uh, I was home working. He had gone into uh, a coma at the hospital, uh, not too far from where I live, and uh, I decided. I mean, I know I couldn't talk with him. I just needed to see him, you know. And so I just, you know, and here's his daughter, his uh, daughter's mom, and, and some other, uh, maybe three or four people. And they were deciding whether or not to say, well, let, let him go. You know, no, you know, at some point when you're in a coma, you're suffering or you, you know, you just, you're not, you can't continue, but they can keep you on life support. Mm -hmm. So they said to me, well, how, how did you know? I said, no, what? They said he decided to go before we could cut, cut you know, cut the, whatever they do, yeah. you know. Plug. Yeah, pull the plug, okay. And I said, that's just like Jeff. You know, say, okay, uh, you know, I'm out of here. I can hear him saying something like, I'm out of here, I'm, I'm ready. You know, what's, what's the next step? So, but that, you know, it was, uh, even to this moment, it's emotional. You know, that he drew me there, mm. and they said, wow, it's great to have one of the members here when he decided to cross over. So I just wanted to add that. I just want to finish this other point. The other thing, we've exhibited in barbershops, museums, and the UN. His idea, um, we, because of apartheid, because of Soweto. Soweto is Southwest Territory. That's all it is. But he saw So We Too. That's Jeff. He organized this group, Acronyms. When I joined the group, it was Co Coalition of Black Revolutionary Artists. Mmm, I like that. Uh, but there was, a, there was a European group called COBRA, and it was confusion. Mm -hmm. So we are AFRI COBRA, Coalition of Black Re Relevant Artists. Yeah, African Union. Uh, and we use bad as an aesthetic term lots of times. Not for the artist, but for the art. Because we know what we mean when we say bad. Mm -hmm. We don't have to explain that anymore. Okay, uh, I think you uh, brought out some good points about Dr. Donaldson, about the Africobra. Uh, now, the uh, first question that I want to address, let's talk about the state of Africobra, the longevity and the survivorship of Africobra. And my question is, what is the future of Africober? And talk about its membership growth, or is there membership growth and its uh, public visibility? Well, its future, I'll start this way. Its future sits right there. That's the future of Africober, all of you brothers and sisters sitting there. Because we exist because you exist. So the future is, is, is concrete. That we don't have to speculate on. We know what that is. Uh, what was the question? Because well, I got stuck on the future. Can I, can I, What's the longevity and survivorship? Well, well, a lot of people ask about membership, and uh, we are not, uh, maybe, maybe uh, a term that I grew up with is called a cattle call, meaning that you, you call on the whole herd. 
Uh, we we are, a, you know, a select organization of people that we, when when a member comes in, we know we can, they can become family. Uh, almost sort of a marriage came to my mind, but uh, we're not trying to be a large organization because it's unwieldy. What we're trying to do is set an example. Oh, this, this group, for instance, could organize and say, okay, uh, we want to start today, you know. Uh, we were inspired and we want to start an organization of that nature, and that's the idea. Not to become large, not to become, un, you know, unwieldy and so forth. Now, because of our longevity, uh, you know, at first it was in Chicago, as was mentioned, uh, because, and, he, and Nelson was encouraged to move close, so, you know, because the meetings were once a week and that kind of thing. Now every it's two every two weeks, okay. And uh, Sunday. on Sunday, okay. Anything else? Okay, no. okay. I'm just, <laughs> no, we, 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 we joke. We joke a lot. Yeah. Let me just say that. But the, but yeah, the, the idea was to uh, come in with a. Um, they used to be called a cadre, and and in, back in the day, uh, a study group, a group that could uh, meet in somebody's living room, uh, you know, and and get along together and so forth. Uh, in, the, in that particular environment. So people ask, well, how do you join? How do you know? It's, it's not, that's not in our mindset, except when somebody like Kevin Cole comes along and say, well, damn, you know, it's like uh, he, can, uh, he, he can run a little faster than us, even though he's, he's hefty, you know, but the, his, his age, you know, put, infuses a certain energy in somebody who is, uh, you know, in the late 70s, which we have a couple of people. I'm not going to look either way, you know, but I'm saying that, okay, <laughs> it's like, wow, we need some energy. We need a little vitamin yeah, yeah. C in here. Oh, hey, that's a new name for you, man, vitamin C. Okay, <laughs> you know, but no, vitamin K, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, C, cold, okay, all right, good, okay. So, <laughs> I'll come up with that. Okay, <laughs> but no, it's the, the idea is that we can get along. Now, we have fussed occasionally. Yeah. Over 48 years, I mean, uh, hey, I mean, you know, that's going to happen. But, uh, and, and there's some members who have had other paths they wanted to take. And so they, they, uh, they, they, they left the group for whatever reason. And then uh, we, we say, well, what is a good round number? And generally it's around 10 people. Okay, there have been, let me just say this. Some of the uh, originators were women. All right, somebody. Somebody, somebody last night asked me, well, how about the women? It's, it's not, we don't have a quota. We don't pick people uh, 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 gender specific. So that, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we're, we're looking at uh, some women who have, uh, you know, worked well for us in different associations to maybe give an invitation, maybe not. So it's not, that's not a big deal in terms of new members or getting to 10 or whatever. So we get along because the rules are not rules then they're, they're not they don't burden us down we we operate with what is successful and our stuff right there Pat, you i think i think being being one of the newest members and being invited in 2004 or five um it wasn't i mean a lot of people when when they when i got the invitation i think that it was wadsworth jurel who was a part of bathic cobra along with his wife Jay Jarrell, there was some of the county members as well. But for, for me, it wasn't, um, I knew of Jeff, and, and Jeff would come back and talk about the organization. And I remember the late Terrence Corbin referring to Africa as being like the Black Panther of the Art Movement. And so I like that in terms of being themselves, and they address a lot of social and political issues, but they also address a black aesthetics. And my work for years have always been about aesthetics, as well as um, making something or creating work that had to do with uh, a conversation with my grandfather, things, things of that nature. So when I came on board, a lot of people were asking, well, you know, you are already here. Why are you coming on board? And I was like, why not? I mean, I understood what they were, what they were uh, going through and what they were trying to say with the work. So it was, it was much easier for me to come on board because my, my work was also had the same aesthetics that, that, that they, were, they were dealing with at that time. But I think that when, when we look at uh, new members, you know, we meet as a group and it's a, it's a deep discussion about who, who fit and everybody don't fit. Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, I think it was Mahalia Jackson said, her son was 
Everybody's thinking about heaven ain't going. <laughs> and, that's, and I think that's the way it is with that. With that well, you see, also, let me just back up a bit. Because in terms of Nelson, I haven't been there on the front end. Africober has a set of principles and aesthetic of philosophy of what drives our work. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to try to give all those to you. You can just Google it up. We're online. Mm -hmm. And those set of aesthetic principles and uh, elements through which our work grew and which drives what we do as image makers. Mm -hmm. Because we, early on, dealt with the concept not just simply as being uh, agents of change, but that we had a responsibility to uphold as an agent of change. And you don't do that in a willy-nilly fashion. And this is back to Jeff again and the, and the kind of foundation of person he is, is that if you have an objective, you have to have a set of guidelines. And they're not rules, and I hate using the word of guidelines because you have a set of standards. That's what it is a set of standards by which you operate and function. And all of us as a collective, a commune, a community, a family, function off of that. We put those principles and that structure together out of our collective lives and looking at how our community responds to those things we call artistic expressions. And from that, we take that in because we are of them, and they are of us. And so we put this body of principles and this aesthetic philosophy together. And that's what has driven our work. That is what has driven the individuals who have become a part of the family. And, and, and it's not so much members, because Kevin's not a member. He's a part of the family. And everyone, we see each other as family and as community because we depend on each other for everything beyond just simply the artistic expression. And so as image makers, that's an important element because the image you project is how you are received in the community and you also have the responsibility of mentoring the youth who come because if they see you as a clown and they expect to be a clown. But they see you as a person of integrity, they expect to be a person of integrity. And so within the framework of this, this matrix called art, there's a special place in there that we find we fit. And we cut that space out and defined it. It wasn't defined by anyone but us. And that us is not simply Afrocoba, but us and the community. Because as Nelson indicated about the print and how we came to get to came to making silk screen prints and the very first one we did is hanging on the wall out there yeah. nation time okay and uh, barbara jones's piece and so uh a set of principles a guiding principles <coughs> and a sense of aesthetics and a philosophy is what has set us well in terms of coming and being able to be here for 48 years because we Surely, I guess, as all of us thought that the revolution, as uh, Gil Scott Harris said, wouldn't be televised, but we thought it would be over a whole lot sooner. <laughs> but we didn't realize that the revolution was a life journey. Oh, yeah. And yeah. the thing is that um, we were a lot more idealistic <laughs> then than we are now because we were a lot younger and we didn't realize what we were really up against. Um, so we thought we could change the world. And it was with that kind of energy and that kind of, I mean, really changed the world. Now, we may have changed the canon of Western art. Mm -hmm. Maybe we changed the world a little bit. But the canon of Western art, we definitely moved that. Yeah. Um, because as now, when your kids, my kids, my grandkids, go to the museum, they can see reflections of themselves. Not in the 14th and 15th and 16th century servant black people, mm -hmm. but in 21st century looking black folk, proud and 
What's the other word? Upward, upward thinking. Dignified. Dignified, like that. Right. Um, yeah. Okay, let, let me stop the panelists right now. Let's take a question from the audience. If everyone has a question from the audience. I'm Barbara Dunn Harrington. Everything I've heard from last night and this morning has just been absolutely awesome. But in my mind, I do see you as having changed the art perception and the art world. But not just the black art world. I think you've changed the art world. But how do you view changing the economics of it as well? And I'll give you an example of a project that I worked on at a at a recent um, historically black college and had, had to do with a piece that Hale Woodruff did back in 1938. And nothing had been done about that piece. And I met with the president and we decided that we needed to, that something needed to be done and we got an appraiser this in. You, Pardon me? Is this the Cinque murals? These are the, the Hale Woodruff yeah. murals okay, that Cinque, are at yeah. Talladega College. And what that, the, just a simple appraisal of those six panels did was change the financial status of that college that was really on its last leg um, because they were simply able to add that to their balance sheet um, as for, from an audit purposes. It gave them a, a whole new perspective and gave the whole new view of economics for the school. How do you view your works as, because I, I see it as just something that's just absolutely awesome, that the story's got to be told a whole lot more. But how do you view those opportunities? Well, you know, uh, artists have to live, um, take care, I have two children, two grandchildren, um, and uh, you, you have to uh, be a pragmatist in one way, and for us, uh, I'll take in over the years has been revolutionary and definitely progressive. Uh, Napoleon referred to us going, uh, some of us going back to school in a later point because we were out in the streets being what we called revolutionaries at the time or whatever, and the universities were not relevant. As a matter of fact, um, uh, my university, how you where well, I teach now, <laughs> uh, they they have prosecuted me for being one of the building takeovers, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so uh, I was very angry. I got drafted, I registered draft, and all kinds of stuff that was going on at the time. But still, I'm a living being who has needs, and I didn't have family at the time, but uh, you know, I had to become a businessman. I mean, you know, it had to operate my art as a business. So, uh, you know, I figured that out, and I and can't go into all of that, but I will say that I went into the institution in the black community that is the best organized, which is the, the black church. And given uh, my work in there initially, I uh, looked at the windows, and that was the most prominent, that the stained glass windows was the most prominent artwork that I found throughout, you know, of the churches that I, I, I attended or looked at or worked in. And uh, I've, I've, I've been doing that for about 35 years, doing stained glass windows for churches, but then I moved out of that and got into other areas that could uh, support stained glass windows. The Metro in Washington, the courthouse in, uh, in, the, in the region, and uh, other concerns. So I identified where the work was. And that, uh, well, the other thing was that there was not black representation in terms of how that happens. For instance, the Metro in Washington, D.C. has a, a mandate to spend $100,000 on each station. And so a few years ago, I guess in 2002, uh, I looked around and I, I said, well, how many blacks have done, you know, and I think it was one. And there are a lot of stations in a, in a metropolitan city, you know, state. So it said, something's wrong with this picture. So I put on my old hat, which was uh, to uh, confront uh, the disparate, you know, the, the situation in terms of uh, our representation, and uh, I found that some of my, uh, uh, you know, people my age had risen to certain points. As a matter of fact, it happened that with the Metro, and I was trying to be blocked, and let me say this, my work is good, okay, it can stand up in, in terms of any, you know, and I know how to work with people and to do, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, the, uh, the best craft and also to, uh, to, to, uh, to speak and to represent myself well. I did all of that, I applied, and I, I was summarily blocked, mm -hmm. okay, from participating, all right? It so happened that a civil rights worker who had gone through uh, this process down here, actually had been with the uh, Freedom Riders and all that kind of thing, had become uh, the uh, president of the board of Metro, okay, Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, all right? She had gone to different organizations, and so when it came up that, well, is this guy being treated correctly? He's professional, he's doing everything right. So she came in, and people were fired, people were hired. A black man hits the whole program at this time uh, for all the stations, and it's just a matter of being fair. It's not saying, okay, we just putting in a black person to show some color. You know, it's just a matter of being fair. And so some other people have followed uh, in that path to be able to get that hundred, in some cases, two hundred thousand dollars for a project. This is pretty fair, you know. And also, the station, my station is called Sankofa One and Two. If you're familiar with that word, uh, it is uh, looking back. And uh, the thing about it is that going forward, going forward, uh, you know, it's a, it's a ceremonial bird. You know, you can research it. But the idea is to set that up. So, you know, I was working in the system. Okay, and I uh, went back to school just to say that at 60 because I said, well, you know, let me just finish up all this so they can't hit me for the credentials and all this kind of thing. So I, I came back to finish up my BFA and my MFA, okay, at, at 60. And, uh, you know, uh, but I had a 30-year career before that because of the quality of my work. People said, well, they even hired me and said, well, we'll, we'll look the other way about the degrees, you know. You can, you can teach here, head up this department. I was head of the department of Duke County School of the Arts because of, 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 of I'll just say, comradeship, brotherhood, sisterhood, and people saying, well, you know, you, you're just an upstanding person, and so we'll figure it out, you know, and how to you know, make that happen. I don't suggest that path to anybody, <laughs> any young people, you know. I don't suggest that path because it was difficult, but it's, it's a story. You know, all of us have stories, and we have to figure it out. But we have to be business persons. You know, we have to be knowledgeable and, and historians about the movement. Well, I, well, I think, I think for me, I learned it here at UAPB when I came in because the first thing I heard was there's no such thing as a starving artist. Right. There's no such thing as a starving and lazy artist. So my path was slightly different because I learned how to do murals here with Henry Lennon, Terrence Corbin and sculpture piece in front of the Fine Art Building with Ernest, 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 Ernest Davis. Mm -hmm. So then came on coming along to get a million dollar project for the Olympics. That was, that, was a, that, that, was, that was easy for me because I knew the format. I learned how to, uh, how to uh, put a, a proposal together, right. how, to, how, to deal with, how, how to deal with those issues. So then that became a different path. So my teaching became something that you know, I could. If I mean, having a family, I could rely on it. But I think a lot of artists don't understand that there's a business part to it. Mm -hmm. And and in that business part, um, there are other things in, in, involved in, in being yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think that um, one of the things that helped me, as I stated earlier, was coming to UAPB, looking at black men that looking like me. They were selling artwork. Terrence Corbin had just won the Delta show. Only the, he was the first African American artist to, to, to actually win. Ernest Davidson had won the Governor's Award. Mm -hmm. Henry Linton had won the Arkansas Art Competition. And, and I'm like, wow, they're sitting in the office saying, well, I'm showing here, I'm showing there. So then that like, you know, they, they look like me. I can do that. So it became mm -hmm. easy, but at the same time, they taught me the whole part about the business of art. How much money do I have to pay on a million dollar project of taxes. Right. Exactly. right. What about insurance? Right. Yeah. You know. So that part have always stuck with me. So, you know, getting you know, commissioned, I think I, I was complaining a couple of years ago about not having a piece in the in the airport. And they did research for the College Art Association and one of the ladies said, Guess who got more commissions in Atlanta than anybody? But finally I got a piece I'm doing doing a piece for the airport. Right. But it's but but actually doing their research and looking at, 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 uh, 
at the social and economic conditions, there's, there's a way that you, that, that, that you can make it. And then when you look at dealing with galleries from around the country, I teach a class that's scared on the business of art. And a lot of artists don't, don't understand that when you're in your studio, it's about making that work. When it's outside of the studio, it's, it's about business. And you, and you have to approach it that way. But Barbara, to your question more pointedly, at least this is my take on it, is that how do we get the, if you will, non-artists to participate in the aspect of giving a financial or monetary foundation to what it is that we do as artists. And I don't mean we as just Africobra. Because uh, the HBCUs and, and, and many individuals have massive collections of work that have an economic value that no one has ever bothered to pay any attention to. You know, sitting at home with people, uh, you know, because I could, Nelson and I, years ago, we were at an NCA conference in Atlanta and went into the basement at Atlanta U uh, and found all that work is now, which is in the collection, mm -hmm. down in the basement. And we're saying, like, look here, man, uh, you know, damn, all we got to do is just go get a big portfolio and we can just take, we can leave with all of that. But the reality of knowing that, you know, uh, the spirits wouldn't allow it and being yeah. raised in the right way, not growing up, I was raised, that we knew that was not correct. But the point being is that Atlanta, you had a mega million dollar collection of work rotting away in the basement, which they now put into proper uh, perspective. But we go to every HBCU and you can go in a president's closet or a secretary's bathroom or somewhere and you find a uh, Hale Woodruff or a Lois May Lou Jones or somebody sitting there with a hole punched in it because they don't know what it is or it's in the, in the closet. That we've got to, which we have been doing as best as we can, but we have to educate the general public about the value of the things that they have and the things that we do beyond the mythology of the Western context about, well, well, when they're dead, it, it's worth something. If it's a piece of garbage to begin with, it's not going to be worth anything more when they're dead. You know, the issue is understanding the quality and the value of what it is and establishing and placing a value from you, the individual, for having that work and understanding that that value transcends, transcends to your progeny and to the future going forward because artists, if you're really doing professional quality work, you are bankable. Most artists don't know they're not, that they're bankable. That's true. You can take that, that's cash money to the bank. But most artists, as Kevin talking about, don't understand the business of art. And many of the people who have these have the work in their possession because I tell you many times you'll see people come to an artist exhibition and they'll buy an offset lithograph that's been signed by the artist which is no different than a Time magazine or a Life magazine cover in a six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollar frame and they're buying a frame. <laughs> but they think they got a fine piece of work of art and they've got a thirty five dollar offset lithograph in a five thousand dollar frame and they really hold it up as very sacred and very valuable dollar-wise, but, it, but it's really not. It's no more valuable necessarily than an automobile. You go and sign a paper to pay $50,000 for it, but you drive it off the lot, stop it in the driveway and back it up, they're only going to give you the used book value. It doesn't matter that you haven't driven it. So we don't understand what really value is. Real property and personal property. Personal property ain't worth anything. Real property is land and those things that have an economic base that the economic world deals with. Mm -hmm. And that's an education that we all have to go through, you know, and understand. And it comes through not only understanding economics, but understanding what the word a print is. Everything is printed if it goes through a process of pressing ink onto the surface of something where it stays. But that doesn't make it a print in terms of quote, fine art that has economic value attached to it that you can bank with. And we need to do... And so there's a difference between a reproduction right. and a print. And lots of people think that their reproductions are prints. Right. And so it's an education. That's a, it's, a, it's a journey that we're all on, those who are in the arts and those who are out of the art, and teaching the economics and the 
realities of the discipline of what the various media are and what those values attached to that are and could be and will be in the future if you care for it and cultivate that. Well, but see, one of the things happening in, in, in 2008 when the market crashed, a lot of people, that they would diversify in their portfolio with art. Mm -hmm. And so that was a way to, you know, that was, that was a way for what, in terms of, of long-term investment. Right. Because that's something that holds its value. Yeah. Let, let's talk about that a little bit more in detail. Let's talk about the, the economics and empowerment of Africa art. Uh, how would you describe the economic power of Africa when it comes to private and corporate collectors? Well, we haven't maximized that at the level that we should. And, and the thing that we, we sold those prints originally at $10. Mm -hmm. They're 500 and 700 and a couple of thousand dollars now. And by and large, the same people that bought them are not the same people that own them now. Right. Interesting. Well, I, I have, uh, in, in several positions, I've, I've hired artists, and I've been hired by the artists. And so when you have a sphere of influence, I'll put it that way, where you know who's doing what, what their social habits are, you can you can you can recommend them, that kind of thing. It it, it counts in terms of now I think I say it's twenty students, is that the people that you work next to in your classroom are the most important people that you're gonna know in your life, you know, above and beyond family and so forth. Because you know what they do. You know when they don't come to class or they in class every day or they know when you don't come to class, or whatever, they know your habits, and so they're your best recommendation. But they should be your business partner. When I left school, uh, when school left me uh, originally, <laughs> uh, 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 I, went, I went into business with uh, similar you know, people as myself, except they graduated on time and all that. But, uh, uh, but uh, we went into business, and for 40 years we ran, well, we had a performing ensemble, I was a visual component, and we, did, we developed a school. Uh, as a matter of fact, Jeff's children were there, and, and other, other artists, Watch was, uh, uh, was mentioned. And so, uh, and I worked with them for four decades until I came to Howard to do to, to, uh, education there, and I was at Duke Ellington School of Arts, I mentioned that. So, but these are all people that were in my circle, and so you would call around and say, man, you know, hard times, you know, I need a job, what's, what's going on? And, uh, you know, they would say, wow, you know, maybe we can create a position if they were so blessed to be in that situation. So economically, we had a, a core. And every group of people, uh, regardless of their ethnicity or their association, have that. But they don't talk about it because it's their, it's their group. And they can't, like, advertise because they don't have all the resources in the world. But if you're not, if you're walking around as an individual, and see, let me say this, really important, I'm, I'm gonna stop myself, is that artists are trained as individuals. Think about it. We're not trained to work in an ensemble. I'm, I'm saying most of the time, 90% of the time. We, we supposed to sit in our studio by ourselves and figure the world out. Now, as a musician, you generally gonna have a group. As a writer, you're gonna write for a play or, or what have you, for a dancer, you're gonna have a dance I mean. And 90% of the time, it's ensemble with the other arts. And so what, what we are saying as an example is that we have to organize and be business persons, you know, to make this happen. To run out in this world as an individual and say, oh, I'm going to make it, why don't they appreciate me? That's not too smart. You know what I mean? And really, I mean, it's just not a smart thing to do, especially in these times. But, but so, like I said, when you look at the, what's important now, if you, if you look at the show that's up now, what individual can say that they own a piece of every Africobra member? That would be something that is, would be very, very unique, you know, in terms of you got a, a piece by everybody. Mm -hmm. and, I, I, and I think that's when we're looking at uh, Hearns, Hearns Fine Art to, Thank you know, you look, at, look at museums to say at the end of the day, we have one of each one of each member of Africa. And that's something as a collective that I strive to, I have everybody but two people a <coughs> uh, 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 member of Africa. You know, that was the before I got in I got in the group. Yeah. 
but you know, also right right here in your own presence. You know, just heard just a nugget of the collection that's hanging out there in the gallery right now. Now, for me, it was an extraordinary experience to walk through there and just visit these works of these people, because every one of them in there, except for those who may have passed on before I was uh, on the planet, uh, I know all these folks. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole n another history that goes with those works, but the point is simply this. On uh, Achilles' point about who you as students, your best friends are for life and the people you will be depending upon, because we all have various collections of work that we've garnered by being with and about the people we grew up with, our peers, our mentors, and those who are our colleagues. And that body of work out there just represents someone else who took the time to get those pieces of work, and as I understand it, they ended up in a drawer somewhere here. And somebody opened up the drawer and said, oh, what? my God, what is it? Mm -hmm. And I have the occasion to feel the same way at home when I open up old portfolios I haven't been in for the last 20 years and see I've got pieces of this person, that person, the other person, the other person. And it wasn't, I didn't, I didn't get that, I didn't collect that, nor did this person necessarily collect that work in terms of saying that down the road this is going to be this, that, or the other. It's about having a love for the work. And if you have a love for the work or a love or a passion for whatever you do, its value is manifest anyway. But if you don't have a passion, and that's still back to your question, Barbara, you know, we, we've got to cultivate that passion. I'd like to get back to uh, and emphasize Jeff Donaldson one more time. I don't know what he got out of Little Rock, um, but he was powerful when he got to Chicago. Um, and I mentioned that we did barbershops, I mentioned that we did museums, and the UN. I did not mention that we mm. exhibited in Africa, in Nigeria, in Lagos, in 1977. And Jeff was the person that organized all the art North American and chose zone. from the zone. North American zone yeah, to prison. go to uh, Lagos on this trip. And he instituted a very important idea. And that was not only did the art go selected, but the artist went too. Mm -hmm. The Charlie Plain. Now that's almost in, in, unheard of. Right. Since then or before then. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the value of the artist going is, okay, you have a dance troupe, they have to be together. You have a singing group, they have to be together. You have whatever, they gotta be. The artists don't. We hung the exhibit and we were loose. <laughs> All um, over the country. For you, I met uh, <laughs> Fela and we had a great time. We researched Fela. You might not know. Fela, I'm just saying, Fela, Fela Kute. Yeah, yeah. Fela Ransom Kute. Um, changed his name while I was over there. Um, I <laughs> went to on, a recording on the, session. On the plane, I was just saying, um, with Stevie Wonder, Louis Farrakhan, and people of that stature. And I didn't sit in my seat. Queen Mother Moore. Queen Mother Moore. I just Going walked, up and I down walked, the aisle. I walked down the aisle. Saying, do you feel it? Do you feel it? And we young, we young people at that time, you know what I mean? But Jeff Donaldson was the president of the North American Zone. It was the time when the oil money started to flow. In Nigeria. In Nigeria. And they had big uh, pipes going down the street. They were pumping that oil out. And, and this is running 24 hours. Everything was new. Right. All the car, and when the car broke down, they just left it. Right. That's the kind of money. They were building buildings, and we lived in a Festag village. Yes. Okay, uh, all new buses, uh, camera equipment, any camera equipment you knew, and they would just leave it, you know, and get the next one. Right. I mean, it was like and it was the first time we were sure that the rest of the world had seen what we had done. Right. right. And we thought that because was the revolution, actually. And, and <laughs> by the way, the people that were invited were black artists from all around the world. So you had black Asians. All the South American countries, Caribbean, Damn, we yeah. had uh, Black Nam. Africa, right. Suriname, Su and Black Europeans, mm -hmm. German, Black they Germans. Were, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. And the music. And they built a uh, village. They built a village. And we lived in the village. Later, the people, Social Security people, took over the building, middle class kind of stuff. Like right, that. after we left. Yeah. yeah. But, but um, the point that Nelson Jeff Donaldson, 
is that all of the artists came and we all of people whose work we knew of but didn't know them right. we got to know them right, right. and to this day that collective body of knowing has continued from 1977 coming forward it was a momentous earth-shaking event Fest also, and, and wait a minute, wait. if you don't think Stevie Wonder is a genius huh. you know, you know, <laughs> look the man came out of curiosity okay he decided there were like about 20 bands that came because they were venues and we played all over you know, the city and, and throughout the uh, parts of the country. He decided, man, I want a gig, man. Okay, and I was in the mix. I, I met his brother and I was concerned about the security because they had about 10 different armies and they weren't kind of unified because they were learning how to be a country. Okay, I said, man, I'm concerned, man. This is our hero, you know? And so I talked to his brother and, well, this is an aside. He said, go and talk to Stephen in the, in the limo, you know? I said, I mean, you know, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> and I went into the limo and I couldn't say a word. I was sitting there 15 minutes and I was drooling and sweating. And, you know, <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, I, I'm admitting it. Okay. <laughs> but but, but, you, but it was in a soccer stadium of 90,000 people, all soccer stadiums. You know, okay. And I'm looking at, you know, our brothers and sisters. I said, this is not my neighborhood. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't know him. Hey, Joe, hey, 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 you get someone. I don't know what's happening. Okay, so I'm saying, man, I'm, I'm worried. And so then his, his brother said, he said, okay, let's, let's go. We finished. And he thought I had spoken with him. You know, Steve was just sitting up here, you know, and, you know, like that. He could hear me, you know, hyperventilating and all this kind of stuff, you know. And so, <laughs> so we got out. And, and then he went to walk. Oh, no. He put, uh, he got one person from uh, different bands and put them together and showed them how to play. I was in the rehearsal, showed them how to play in one rehearsal, showed them how to play uh, their instrument, mm. all right? But they knew his music because, you know, the people, everybody knew his music. So, you know, but different people, not one band who knew each other, but a person from different bands, all right? Put them together, got them drum show. Now I'm gonna like, I'm gonna just hit like this, like that, play on the piano, you know, and I think he picked up a horn or something too. But anyway, you know, after rehearsal, we had the place, you know, I'm, I'm hyperventilating, I get out, and all these people jump out the stands and run onto the field as he's processing to the stage, all right? And I said, man, this is what I, this is what I, you know, and don't you know, they stopped just like this and made this aisle, made, a, made an exact aisle, man, for him to walk now. Yeah. You know, they, a path. You know, they, and they ran out of, they jumped, in front. you know, I said, oh, God, you know, no, no, please. You know, and they, they had this out, and he, he, he threw down, I mean, it was the most magnificent thing. And then a month later, after the festival, he brought his man over there to play in the National Museum to really say, okay, this is, this is my people, my so I'm really, I'm sorry, but I, that was just a memory that, that rose up. But see, <laughs> this, to, this experience, these <laughs> memories that keep us alive, Yes. are the memories that yes. are made because of a collective. To come easy. down from heaven. Okay. <laughs> let, let's give Adrian. Adrian yes. Let's give Adrian. Uh, and let's I'm talk on. about economics in this day and age. Mm -hmm. You have the internet. I never thought when I was making art that you could buy art off of the internet. But that's a big, big, big business nowadays. And as an artist, I think you have to think about the possibilities that the internet offers at this point because it's it's the internet right now in terms of selling art is like the wild west in the old days. Mm -hmm. There are no rules. Mm -hmm. and no how, rules. how does that relate to the, the modern contemporary gods that we have today in terms of supporting artists, uh, getting artists to join them? What's the trend with having a gallery as opposed to uh, using the internet? I think having a gallery is great if you have a gallery. If you don't have a gallery and you're looking to sell your work, the internet is a place that where you can start because you have an international, worldwide audience. You've got Japan, China, got every, everywhere else to serve, you know. <clears throat> it's hard to get into a gallery to begin with, to have somebody selling your work. There are a lot of changes you have to go through to do that. Whereas if you have a product, you can go right on the internet with that product and sell it. And there have been several artists who've been very successful at selling 
actually mediocre <laughs> on the internet. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a it's a big business. If you're thinking about trying to sell your work as an artist uh, and you don't have a gallery and you don't have those kind of connections, to have a gallery selling your work takes a little bit of time. You know, they have to, you know, there's a lot of changes you have to go through to get that gallery that's going to represent you in the right way and sell you at the right price, you know. You got you have to build up to that and start out right away. You have to have sort of a rep to really begin there. But I think there are lots of ways now uh, utilizing the internet to sell art. But you have to also do be professional about that as well. You mm -hmm. just don't simply uh, send your work out. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's if you're gonna be if you're gonna do this as a life profession, you've got to approach it just like any other profession. Because if you're hiring a carpenter and he shows up at the door and asks you if you got hammers and saws, then <laughs> you don't have a carpenter you hired. You got somebody who came to get some money. And so I just say you, you definitely have to be fully professional about it. And uh, granted, the internet is an absolutely good uh, place to do that, but it's also a very easy place to be ripped totally naked and have your work gone and ain't nothing you can do about it because it's, it's out there as in the other place. And so uh, it's all about being professional. And then I, I, think, I think about when you look at the internet um, in terms of scams. Right. So I mean, I, I, one incident happened to me at the gallery I was dealing with in Oakland. Uh, a gentleman that called her and saw stuff on my, on my website, went to her to uh, turn around. He had her to do an exchange with Western Union, right? Okay, then she, she got the money. And she sent them, she sent the money to me. And I'm, happened, then all of a sudden the FBI shows up at the gallery. He had taken uh, somebody's <laughs> credit card, and we never sent to work. Luckily, we never sent to work. And she called me, she said, well, I said, I still got to work. But the FBI showed up. Right. Because that was a scam. It was somewhere in, in the UK. So then, like I tell people in terms of artists, you know, and I tell a lot of, you, a lot, a lot, a lot of young artists, um, the, 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 the internet is there for them, but at the same time, you can establish a relationship with that client about buying work. They can pay it on time. Right. And there's this thing called Square. You can get on your phone. Yeah. That was, that's the best thing since sliced bread. Because people, they'll put the credit card mm -hmm. out, they'll, they'll pay it. But I always, I always tell people when they first start buying, they start buying small pieces. Then you grow. Because I've never had a, a collector to not buy one piece and come back and get a big piece. Or buy one from by one of each each series. But I always tell people there's also a payment plan. I tell students all the time, if you got 10 people, they're sending you $100 a month. That's $1,000 that you can depend on. Yeah. Now you got to make a decision if you're going to give them artwork or not. Nine times by the 10, when you finish paying, then you get the yeah. art. Right. But I've been blessed well with a lot of my clients. Once they pay it halfway, they sit on the wall, they'll turn around and finish paying for the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the rest of it. Yeah. So I mean, so there's a lot of ways to do it. And, and the thing about it now, the, the arts is a billion dollar, billion dollar industry. And, and people don't actually re re realize that. And if you go to Miami at, at Art Basel, <laughs> you're talking about they spend that Wednesday, they said several billions. And even in New York at the National Black Fall Art Show, they, was, they said from that Wednesday, to that Sunday, yeah. a billion dollar worth of African American art was being purchased. On that here. note, on that note, we're gonna take a ten minute break. We've been running a little bit over an hour. Okay. Um, we'll come back in ten minutes, and then we. We'll... You feel it from the moment you enter our campus. It's a legacy of greatness. We are the Golden Lion family, committed to innovation and truth. We all come from different places, but now call the Pride Lands home. Whether it's the sciences, arts, or business, we're shaping the minds that one day will reshape the world. The University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Become a part of the Pride. I see you mobbing over her. Let's go. Let's mob. Let's crawl. Mm -hmm. 
let's crawl. Mm-hmm, 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 let's crawl. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Hey, yo, we mobbing. Come on, girl. Let's crawl. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Hey, yo, let's crawl. Boom. Hey, yo, let's crawl. Boom. Hey, let's crawl. Hey, yo, let's crawl. Boom. Okay, welcome back. We are back here with Alfred Cobra now at the the Arts and Science Center here in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Uh, welcome back. I'm your moderator, Danny Campbell, Chairman of the Department of Art at the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. I wanted to ask the audience if they had a question they they wanted to address to the panel. Hello, my name is Cicely Trice, and I'm an art teacher right now I've gone to the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff and had wonderful influences through high school uh, they were I had teachers like Virginia Himes that motivated us constantly to go against the grain not settle for anything and I'm experiencing a lot of kickback in my classrooms now from this millennial um, <laughs> group of young people because they feel like because they have so many options and so much at you know at hand what um, what could I do? What advice could you give me to just motivate them more? You know, I'm constantly motivated. Being here, I am on cloud nine, but how can I take that and transcend that into my classroom, my students? Well, I, I think, I think having taught in public schools and college and from elementary to college, uh, one thing I found is with, with students, and I've taught in, in some of the rough areas of Atlanta as well as in Chicago, um, this new group of students are not like we were. It's like it's a whole new wave. It's like the microwave, everything instant. I had a group of uh, students to travel from out west. I'm not going to tell you what university. And instead of them coming in, coming in my studio and asking about how many hours I spent uh, in the studio, how did I get from A to B, the only thing they wanted to know was how to make money. Okay, they wanted to know how, I mean, they, it wasn't, you know, for two hours, we sitting there, they, they looked around the studio, well, you know, how do you get Michael Jordan to buy a piece? I mean, that, that was their whole thing. But I think in the, in, the, in the public school system, you have to let them be themselves. First thing I do, or any visiting artist I've done in the public school, I have the teacher to have the students to write me a, a letter on how do I see myself. So it's telling me about them. And I'm able to, once I get to that school, I'm able to talk to them about what is it that you'd like to do? And how, why, is art, why is art important? Everything we got is designed by somebody. I mean, this is a, a computer. It was designed by somebody. When um, you look at shoes, the tennis shoes, you know, I mean, everything is designed, so you, you have to make the lesson plans more personal but to, to them, but then we're dealing with another th situation where we have to be a counselor. You're dealing with social, I mean, it's the, the conditions are enormous about what we have to deal with in 55 minutes and then try to teach them art. You know, so, I mean, you, you, you do the best you can, but you gotta, there's always that one or two. I mean, I've learned, I've taught in, I've taught in magnet programs that that one or two that I'm just trying to get them to understand to be a productive citizen. I don't care if you're an artist. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's up to you. I just don't want you to be, be, be in prison because it costs us $300,000 to maintain the issue. I believe in, it's about money, okay? So if you can get them to be a productive yeah. citizen, you've done your job. And get them mm -hmm. interested in something that yeah. they like. Normally, I know, it, I know in my school, I come from my high school, uh, we uh, we had a Heisman Trophy winner. They come there for sports, and I have to explain that only one out of one out of uh, one out of eighty-eight thousand become a professional athlete. 
When you get them to understand that, you know, uh, because, I mean, that's what they think. I, I'm going to grow up either be a rapper, but if you find those one or two who like computers or like the arts in terms of be, being creative. And, and, and it's one thing I always tell, I always tell my principal, I can go in, I can teach math, I can go in, I can teach science, but they can't come in and teach art. I, and one time I told, I told one of them, I can run the school, <laughs> but you can't come in and, and teach what I do. And, and the whole thing about teaching, teaching art, it, it's about problem solving. Mm -hmm. And that's what we teach every day. Yeah. You know, and so uh, I would say the best advice is try to get to know your students and know what you can say. And I always use this example. I studied with Mr. Howard, and Mr. Howard, it would always, it, it was a pain composition. He would give Dorothy Porter, your teacher, A's, and give me a B. <laughs> and Dorothy would do these folk type painting, but I'm like, Dorothy can't paint. <laughs> you know, I mean, in, 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 in my 17-year-old mind, there I was at 17, I was getting art shows, and, and finally I said, Mr. Howard, I said, look, I don't mean to harm Mr. Howard. You give him, Dorothy can't paint. <laughs> and he told me, he said, you know what? Dorothy's gonna be a good art teacher. Mm. You're gonna be an artist. But in my 17 year old mind, Dorothy can't paint. <laughs> That's all I was saying in my mind. But he knew what to, he, he knew what to say to me, yeah. to keep me going. Now at the end of the semester, I got an A. Right. But he was pushing me. I never forget. He gave me a B plus plus plus. <laughs> I'm like, what, what, is, what is that? <laughs> a. You know. Yeah. But no, no my I mean, right. on, on, on the drawing, and right. he said, just to push me a little bit farther, a little bit farther. Just do go over a little bit yeah. farther. And but that's why I said you, you got to know your students. Yeah. And, and, and you got to know you got to know what to say to them. Your point. I would suggest in your lesson plan to do a self-portrait in every class. Oh, you do that, great, for, for every art teacher, because at least 50% of the issue is social or socialization. And, you know, what I discovered just late, I've only been housed six years. Before that, I was practicing, and then I was uh, helping to run a school. But anyway, to say when it's applicable, I'm proud of you. Yeah. You know, because the deal is that they're not hearing that and probably anywhere else. Uh, I tell them, I tell everybody, actually, I love you unless you prove me wrong. Or, you know what I'm saying? I, 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 I give that to you. I, I, I say I love you, and then if you say I don't love you back, or I'm going to do something that's not lovable, let's say, then it changes because I'm not a fool. Okay, you know, I protect my heart, all right? But we have got to wrap our arms around these children, all right? And I'm saying physically, and I mean, you have to be careful not to be inappropriate because, you know, then all this confusion happens, you know? So I, I have a technique of grabbing their arm and then I hug like that so they don't, the young ladies, they don't press. <laughs> okay, so, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, they're, they're techniques. And yeah. the brother, you know, Brother, you know, it's like, but they, you know, I mean, they have not gotten a hug from a parental figure. I go at it cases, uh, so. just a little bit differently. <laughs> All my students are geniuses. Okay. I start there. You can lower yourself, but they all start as geniuses. And uh, one thing, I used to take a class down to New York from Amherst, Massachusetts, three hour drive. And we go to the Schomburg, we go to the Studio Museum, we go to a couple of galleries downtown. The first couple of years, it was okay, but I didn't tell them what to do until we got back sometimes. And my favorite thing now is to find what you like. Mm -hmm. Everybody can find what they don't like and quit. Mm -hmm. But find the thing that you like and defend it. Why do you like it? And that has been very valuable to me. Um, if they, there's five different things, there's one that's their favorite, whatever, 200. Why? What? Can you defend it? Why? You know. Um, but I've, I've been very successful producing geniuses.
<laughs> well, I, I think for me, I try to get the students, uh, first of all, to find out what's going on inside, you know. What, what are you in here for? Oh, you don't need to be in here. You ain't, you're not interested? You know, what's going on with you? I had a photography class. I wouldn't give them a camera the first week. They go, oh, wow, we're going to take pictures. I said, no, you ain't taking nothing. We're going to go outside. It was wintertime in Chicago, cold. I said, we're going to look. So what do you mean we're going to, we're going to look? I said, we'll go outside. Look, 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 look. Well, what are we looking for? Pictures. Something that you like or you don't like. Tell me what you, and then we go back in, and they write, oh, I didn't like this, or I like this. Uh, next time, next week, I said, okay, you're going to get a camera, but you're not going to get any film. Oh, oh I said, yeah, and you're going to take pictures, you're like you're actually taking pictures. But I found that it worked really good, because when they got filmed, they had an idea of what they wanted to photograph. Mm -hmm. I took mm -hmm. them out in the snow, snowing, we had the camera, I took them out in the rain, I took them out in all these different, I took them to places where there was garbage, you know, all these to see. And it worked, it worked, it worked really well, you know, because they, at the end of the time, they had a show of their work and everybody was saying, well, who took these pictures? And they said, Don, these, I said, no, they're my students, don't talk to me, talk to them. So this one little girl says, oh, Mr. Gallagher, he has out looking at garbage and dead rats and this and that and that. But she had beautiful pictures. You know, they had beautiful pictures because they began to see. Mm -hmm. But these were kids that were truly interested in photography. I don't know, you get somebody who's not interested, it's a hard thing. To, I like Nelson's point of view, you're a genius, you know, bring him down mm -hmm. from there. But they have to be open to, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Similarly, uh, I would always start my class out in a similar way to Nelson. I say, everyone has an A. You know, that's what you all want. Now, the grade you end up with when you leave here is up to you. Mm -hmm. I say, it's easier to keep up than try to catch up. Because mm -hmm. you cannot catch up with me. I'm moving too fast. Mm -hmm. So stay with me, and you'll get there. I say, but the issue is simply this. You have to approach it with a passion. Yep. This is not classwork for a grade. Right. You already got the grade, so the grade is not what we're in here for. We're in here to get a connection with what it is. This, if it's art history, art appreciation, printmaking, weaving, whatever it is, you're in here to get this. And this requires work and a commitment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, the millennium, millenniums or millennials or whichever they are, the techies folks. Mm -hmm is I would, you know, they all want to do computer art. I said, I'm not opposed to computer art, but can you draw? Do you know color? I said, but okay, do computer art, but let me challenge you with this. You got this extraordinarily creative mind. How many of you know how to write programs for a computer? Nobody can raise their hand. I said, now, what it is you've just done is trapped yourself at the limit of creativity of the person who made the program. If you're thinking beyond that and that's all you know how to do is work with what they've got there, you're already stuck. But if you know how to draw, know how to paint, you understand color and theory and all the rest of that, you can go beyond whatever else, somebody else's limitations are. So open yourself up to go to your maximum limitation by understanding all of the intricacies that's involved <coughs> in the mediums that you want to use to create art. So if you want to use a computer, understand programming. Because, and understand also that if you ain't got no electricity, you ain't got no art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, but I got a pencil. Yeah. I may want yeah. me a Conte crayon, but I got a pencil. I can make a portrait. I can draw. But you ain't got no juice, you can't get nowhere. So I just try to have them become fully passionate about whatever it is and seek to learn the subject as opposed to getting a grade. Because it's sort of like folks who, they want a job, but they don't care about what it is. They want a check, they don't want a job. Yeah. Okay, let's take another question from the audience here. I would be remiss if I did not um, tell Mr. Campbell, thank you for having you all here. And I'm truly blessed. I've got my two mentors and teachers here. And so, um, and of course, Marjorie, her teacher was Chef Donaldson. So my question would be, 
for, I'm an art teacher and I'm an artist in North Little Rock, Arkansas. The problem I'm having with education is my principal wants me to produce great artists. And so I always um, go into my classroom as the catalyst to be passionate and to give love and um, to encompass that and then later find out who my great artists are. But his whole thing is he wants to produce great art. Like <laughs> he wants an art exhibition, he wants uh, an art fair. How do I bring it to him to let him know that um, that's produced over time? And these are elementary kids. Mm. Ask him how it long takes... did it take for him to become what he is? <laughs> well, exactly. yes, exactly. Well, what... exactly. Microwave. Exactly. Yeah. But and well, how far are you at 27 years old? Uh, but, what have you but, created at 27 years old? Pardon? What have you created at 27 years old that's lasting? Well, well, well also one of the things that I mean, it's like a common sense thing that it, I tell teachers, and I teach advanced placement to teachers all all all, all over the world. Uh, at SCAD, they come, but. One thing that I found in building a good program, it takes three to five years, mm -hmm. okay? Now, and he also must give you the, the funds you need. Right. Because with no money, you can't create a, a good fair. Now, I'm, as, a, as a teacher, one of the ways I've been blessed to, to be so successful in terms of building a program, the first thing I would ask a principal when, whenever I went to a school, number one, I need to wear blue jeans. Number two, I need display cases, okay? Number three, I need the funds to, to and I need, I need the funds to help uh, map the work. Uh, and, and most of the time in the elementary schools, there's not a lot of c c competition. But they normally want a art fair at the end of the year. I don't do bulletin boards and I don't do backdrops. <laughs> I mean, that, that's, not, that's not a part of my repertoire. Right? And I even, went to, I even went to bat with one principal on the, on the state level. He tried to say, I said, no, that's not, I'm here to teach the kids. Okay? He didn't like it, but when, when, which was fine. But I just think it takes three to five years. But you need those students. I mean, normally in elementary, you get maybe, 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 maybe 45 minutes, and then you are you, they just say, as a backdrop for other academic teachers. He has to appreciate the arts also. One way that I got my principal's attention when I did do elementary was we did have a, a fine arts fair. Uh, the chorus teacher, the music teacher, we all got together and had something at the end of the year. And each year it got better. But I'm like, I need funding mm -hmm. to make these things happen. Okay. Uh, so my name is Ian Johnson. Uh, I'm an instructor at University of Arkansas at Palm Bluff. Danny Campbell is my colleague, and Kevin Cole is one of my mentors. Okay. The question that I have uh, from early, I was listening to the group talk about how you're perceived and standards, and I want to know how have you kept these high standards for so many years, and what would you tell a young person that was trying to, I guess, emulate your path, how they should go about that? Well, let me say this phrase, uh, you get better with age. You know, and that's, that's the attitude. And so we have to live up to that phrase. Uh, you know, education of oneself is a cumulative affair. You're building on a foundation, which is basically your upbringing, your, your parents and how they raise you in the household and how they encourage you. I think the conversations I've had with all of us is that they had in the home someone who said, this person, this child, need some encouragement. Look, look, they're reaching out to this field and uh, let's keep them out of trouble or, you know, whatever the, you know, it's, it's encouragement. That's important. And so we are taught that and therefore as parents and as teachers, we, we do the same thing. Uh, you know, you have to, you have to shine. You actually have to aura. Actually, uh, this is personal. I used to see auras and I thought I was going crazy before a while. You know, and but and, you know, I was so intense. It seemed like there was this stuff vibrating around people, and it was like a language. And then I got scared. I said, "God, turn it off because I'm not ready for this, <laughs> inti this intensity or to be some kind of other person than an artist." But anyway, uh, people have smells, 
And it's unfortunate that we use so much perfume because there, there is all kind of animal instincts that we possess that somehow we cover it up or we're not using it. You know, I mean, uh, you know, some people study body language, but there is a, but there's a phrase, for instance, in D.C., uh, uh, you know, that girl got your nose open. Okay. Why? Don't we? Anybody no. heard that? Yeah. That's not just in D.C. Drive a truck. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right. If you don't you know drive that. Drive a truck through. If, <laughs> what, what happens is that when you're excited, your nose flexes. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And your ears sometimes, at least mine do, I've been told, you know, and your eyebrows go up. And all kinds of things that happen, and, you know, hormones and all that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, but it's, it's part of recognizing and seeing, somebody, as you were talking about, and seeing, uh, and, and the difference of just seeing or looking and seeing, for instance. I mean, you know, to really study and to be proud of, 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 of uh, who you are. And we, we stand as examples. We've decided to say we're an example, all right? And in many cases, we've got to check ourselves because we backslide. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we're human. And so we say, okay, you say not me. That's what he's saying right now. <laughs> but uh, we're human, but we have place ourselves as an as example and said, you know, we, we, we are trying our best and, you know, it helps us to give us um, that kind of challenge to ourselves. And that's what, what all of us need to do. And you all here, I don't think anybody made you come. I don't know, maybe they encourage you. Anybody get paid to come? I don't, I don't know. But no. the point is, is that this is the, van, you're the vanguard. You said, I got all this stuff I could be doing. Right, but this is your research, you know, for your class. You, just, you say, I was at this thing this summer, I did this for you, to your students. And of course, you're doing it for yourself, also, your investment. But, you know, that's the kind of, you know, the advanced God, that's what the vanguard is, the advanced God. You're saying, well, I could be doing a lot of things, but I think I want to be, uh, I think this is going to be interesting. And let me just say, all my students know the definition my definition of interesting, which is worthy further in, uh, investigation. Worthy, no, it, further it, well, I attended this class. Right, right. <laughs> worthy of further, further investigation. investigation. So if something is interesting, wow, I think, now as audience, we want our work to be interesting because we don't want people to walk past it. We want it to be worthy of further investigation and purchase, you know, of course. You know, so a, piece I'd, a piece I'd like to add is that it's been so long since I was a kid, I forgot this. I wasn't allowed to buy a card for anybody. I had to make the card. My parents understood early. It was cheaper, one. It kept me off the, you know, but I had to make the card. And I think that's a common kind of thing that we've all been through. Um, and I think, I think it's very important. Because yeah. I had to make them for my family. Art is the outward uh, expression of inner development. Mm. You have to continually develop yourself inside, and then it comes out. Very, very important to continue to investigate everything, everything in your life, all of it. What you see, what you feel, what you think, the music, everything. All those things work inside to make you express something. Very, very, very important. Developing curiosity. Curiosity is you. But, but also at, at the same time, I think you gotta look at, when you look at standards, I think mm -hmm. students will rise to your standards mm -hmm. if you keep them there. Right. Yeah. And I don't know if you recall when, when your classes, you all came in saying, we got homework in art. You stopped doing the homework, you got a bad grade. Mm -hmm. But I would tell you at the end of the thing what it took for you to raise your grade. And I never shall forget that Terrence Bowen had us always writing that sketchbook. And I tell the teachers now, good art is the result of intelligent decision making. Mm -hmm. That's what good art, whether it's abstract, it's realistic, or whatever. But good art is the result of intelligent decision making. Number one, I can't teach you if you can't follow directions. We're talking about life's goal. Mm -hmm. And I, and I tell anybody, they always say, well, I came in, I couldn't draw. Yeah, I can teach you to draw. Right. Miles Davis didn't, didn't come out playing a, 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 trumpet. a trumpet. 
My other to learn how to play the trumpet. And I, and I always tell kids, you come in, I can teach you to draw, that's easy, but you gotta have that desire to want it, to do it. Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna keep my standards, because these are my standards, and you're gonna rise up to my standards. And at the end of the day, of course, I'm gonna always reward you, or I'm gonna give you a kind word. But we're gonna, we're gonna get there. And I think that with a lot of our kids, we become, and I never should forget, it. we always say, excuses are just like behind, everybody got one. So we're not going to deal with that. And I, I never should forget being in a, a painting class. I used my crutch, I used my, my stuttering as a crutch until Corbin put me aside and said, now you're going to get up, you're going to take what you like about your work, what is it that you dislike? Because you have to talk about your work, mm -hmm. whether you like it or not. I came up with every excuse. And I went outside, I said, that little short man, he think he bad. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I can say. But the thing, what it, what it taught me, that I had to learn how to deal with what I was dealing with at this time. And, 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 and the standards were way higher than they have now. I mean, we, yeah. we had to, I mean, we, you're talking about, we were always in the, in the, in the art department working. Right. You know. See, and that's the... And see, now, they say that they broke in. I never did break in there. I was in there, but I didn't break in. <laughs> oh, oh, I just walked in. <laughs> You're not giving up any secrets. <laughs> oh, okay. Paul, let's, let's Paul, Clay, one more Paul Clay, Paul Clay said, "Art does not reproduce the visual, <clears throat> but makes visual." That was very profound to me. Let's let's take another subject. We're going to change the topic just a little bit, and I want to throw this at you. In respect to the growing trend of racial and police brutality in America, how and what can Africa do to help in that social arena? Go ahead, Nelson. Uh, I, I want to go back uh, for a minute to that card that I was talking about, because the card that I made was later described to me as a visual love letter. And I think I've continued to do that. Yes. And let me say okay. that it's, uh, if you accept my edit, it's a growing awareness. Because it's not happening more now. We are aware of how much is happening. OK? That, you know, I mean, you have, in every field, you have good and bad people. It's, it's extremely unfortunate, particularly for us as people, to be identified as victims by people with police forces that have a gun and a badge and are legally able to abuse us. That's a problem. But I, I know police officers in D.C. They're bad ones to go with. have people in my family. And so I know that they are good and bad people. The problem is that no bad people should be a police officer. Okay, because of the fact that they're carrying weapons and they have this, uh, these laws behind them to support this abuse. What we as artists, and I'm talking about visual people, mm -hmm. are doing, and you see it on Facebook, you see it in people posting things, their people are taking out their cell phones and becoming videographers immediately. Okay, that's a profession. But when you look at their composition aesthetically and see what they're doing, and they're, they're trying to show different angles, they say, look, no, he hit them like yeah. that. They're making aesthetic decisions on the, on, in the moment when they might be turned on and shot also, or beaten also. So that's the hell of a thing. This is, it's, it's like the, the artists of uh, the Wall of Respect, they were, they were had to be looking around yeah. as they were painting for what's going to happen. I mean, that had never been done. In Chicago, I'm talking about it. We talked about it earlier. All right, that had never been done. You painting on the wall, there must be a law against that. Mm -hmm. All right, there must be black people painting a wall. All right, they could have been shot mm -hmm. at that time. Okay, they were threatened. All right, so, but we have to stand up to this and say that kind of activity, we're able to document it. But at the same time, we need to give a vision of, well, respect and freedom in the work that we do. And so now, when you study our work, and I hope you do, we work very differently, but there's a common thread that comes to, when, when you see an exhibit out, say, oh yeah, that, that makes sense as a whole. But we address issues, but the main issue we're dealing with, we don't, we cannot have our spirit broken. Mm -hmm. 
the, 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 the three components, mind, body, and spirit. You cannot be successful with a broken spirit. And that's, that's key to us because we are, some of us, are close, closer to being spirits. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to be morbid or anything. I'm just saying we, you know, and I'll be able to look up at the ceiling and say, wow, you know, uh, this kind of, you know, this is near the, one of the conclusions mm -hmm. of the chapters. And I'm looking for another 20 years and my children, I think, will take care of me. You know, but at the same time, it's inevitable. So we're saying, what is our contribution before we become spirits? You know? but, but I think I think that sometimes too is we may do pieces and you may never see them. Uh, I had the curator from the High Museum to come in. I did some pieces on Trayvon Martin. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I I don't know when I'm gonna show them. And one of the, the things I did these I did these these ladders, and Trayvon Martin was 17 years old, and. George Zimmerman's comment was, they always get away. There's 17 letters and they always get away. And the piece is titled, But Not Trayvon. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm doing a blanket for the Emmanuel Nine. But I may not never show it. I mean, I may mean, not never show it at all. But, but I had to get that out, out, of my, out of my system. So, I mean, we do things in our mm -hmm. sketchbooks that you may never see in the public. But at the same time, the body of work that we have been doing for 48 years has been addressing all of those issues. Yeah. You see, and it's, one doesn't have to address the issue by saying, you know, Black Lives Matter, yeah. stop to this, or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, protest. <laughs> it's not about protestation, but it's about affirmation. We, our body of work, and what Kevin just spoke about in terms of the trail, that's about an affirmation. It's not about a protestation. You see, people try, we're not oppositional, but affirmative. And so in so doing, being an affirmative, taking an, a, an affirmative stance, you automatically are moving in the positive, as opposed to a reactive stance in terms of being protesting or oppositional. Opposition means that you've Actually, from my perspective, you've taken ownership of whatever that is. We won't take ownership of that. That's over there. That's a negative. We move on to positive. Mm -hmm. And so Afro Cobra's body of work addresses all of those issues, but not from an adversarial or protestational position, mm -hmm. but from the affirmation of our humanity. Mm -hmm. And so when that piece out there, nation time, yeah, you got to raise fists and hold. We understand that period of time. That was a protestation going on, but the protest, nation time is not a protestation. Nation time is an affirmation. And Africa, has, our body of work has always been about affirmation. And so everything that you ask, how do we address that, is being addressed by being in the affirmative. Sure. When Amen. we were showing our works on the UN floor in 1975, we all did a piece for the children of Soweto and Steve Beagle. Mm -hmm. I did a piece, it's a, in fact, AJ printed it at Bob Blackburn's uh, workshop. And it's a black mass that seems to be flying apart and coming together at the same time. And I broke the words up, so we too, anybody who's involved with that all over the world, whether you're black or white, if you subscribe to racism, you're part of the problem. But the black race can never be destroyed. It's flying apart, but yet it's coming together. And it's really flying apart and coming together because I'm weaving this particular lithograph here. I'm going to tell you this. <laughs> kicking my behind. It's been 20 years, 20 years. <laughs> However long. It's coming apart and coming back together. Yeah. But it's about the affirmation. Yes, yeah, it's really. an affirmation, even right. though it's for the children of Suedo and Steve. Because you can't destroy the black race. It will maybe fall apart or explode, but it will always come back together. It will never be destroyed. And it's another thing. It's an African mode of dealing with time and space. It's called fractal, thank you, fractal mass. And when you deal with that, this is the master of fractal painting and James. These two. James Phillips. James Phillips, the other Africa who will be here later in, this, in the exhibition. 
And all of that is about just simply affirmation and reaffirmation, affirmation and reaffirmation. And this goes to your point, brother, about how does an artist work with their standards, is that your only competition as a artist or as a person about having high standards is yourself. Yep. Not the person next to you or the person out there. High standards is dependent upon you. And those high standards are attained by working. You know, when artists, people say, yeah, man, I'm an artist, but you know, I've been trying to find a studio. To... No, show me the work. <laughs> Don't be talking about studio space, but see, that'll help, you know, work with prisoners. In a prison, you got 45 prisoners in one cell, and none of them can have a paintbrush. They can only have the bottom part with the bristles. Hey. There's, there's something about, else about what we do, and that is uh, most of the other areas, sports, or, or some of the other arts, is about immediate gratification. Mm -hmm. um, we, it takes us a while longer to get recognized for what we do. You see the average age here. 35. Uh, yeah, <laughs> obviously. But that, that has to uh, come into the consideration too. It takes a while to produce the piece. Um, other arts, other arts uh, can be mo a lot more immediate. Ours is about time. And what, the one thing that made me a su very successful junior high school teacher is because I preserved the work that they did. They had done work at home and their little brothers and sisters had torn it up. Not, not anywhere near my classroom. And once they understand that you respect it, mm -hmm. you've won. Because it's a small club. Mm -hmm. It's a very small club. There's 10% there's, there's of the population that has perfect pitch. You can be in the next room, my cousin, and bound on the piano and she can tell you what the keys are, perfect pitch. Relative pitch, there's, a, there's another fraction, three or four percent. Small percentage, those are musicians. Visual is about the same thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to the other extreme where there's color blindness and all kinds of things. But perception is very important. And, <coughs> yeah. I try to be sure. Amen. Before anyone else make an additional comment, I would like to say that we have come to the end of our schedule today. Um, well, I got a little more to say. Yeah, we got more to say. <laughs> well, Nelson, what we want you to do is save it for next time, okay? Yeah. Save it for tonight. Uh, Please. One more question. It just concerns me deeply that, I mean, those of us are so honored to be in this audience today, but I had a friend who um, was a college classmate and he went on to be a really good photographer. His dad was a photographer, his name is Chester Higgins, Jr. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that Chester used to say to me all the time, and he still does, he said one of the greatest gifts that he had was living in Brooklyn, living in Harlem, and every Saturday morning going down and having coffee with folks like Albert Murray and everybody yeah. who was left around from the Harlem Renaissance. Oh, and yeah. he just said that, and I just wish there was some way we could set up coffees with you guys all around. The, I mean, I just want young people to know these stories because even when I talk to Chester now, and he and I intern, had a couple of interns together when we were in college, um, and, and we, he, he said, of all experiences I've had, he just recently retired from being a photographer with the New York Times, but he said my, the greatest was going down on Saturday mornings, um, spending time with those great people just to sit around. And he said, we'd say we're going to meet for coffee at 9 o'clock, and we look up and it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon and we're still drinking coffee. And there was so much to talk about that he learned from those men and women. So what can we do to get you guys out there? Well, residencies. You can bring residencies, okay? The person that got us here is the person we should talk about. Right. That's a person named Garbo Hearn. Garbo Hearn. Um, if you are interested in collecting, if you're interested in meeting those people that you're talking about, Garbo Hearns knows them. Mm -hmm. um, 
and she is nationally respected, not only locally loved, but nationally respected. And um, and there aren't a lot, there are, like I said, it's a small club. So there are many cities this size that don't have it. You, so you, can't, you can't assume that it is everywhere. That's what I'm getting at. And you already have an in, an entree to that. And it, it could be somebody's living room. I yeah. mean, uh, but we're here. I mean, relish the moment. We are here together. And we are sharing, and it's being videotaped using the technology and so forth. I mean, Alvin Murray, a very important writer, if you don't know. Tuskegee. You know, a very important organizer. A mm -hmm. great friend of Romare Beard. Mm -hmm. He introduced me to Romare Beard. Esthetician. Who wrote me a letter of recommendation. And it was like, I took it to somebody and said, when do you want to have a show? I said, you don't want to see my work? This is the letter from Romare yeah. Beard. Yeah. When do you want to show? Yeah. You know, I mean, just like that. It was like magic. Everybody probably can't get that gift. But I'm trying to give it up as much as I can because I owe the universe. Okay, I owe the universe. It's like what, you know, this letter. And I mean, that's what we all have to be. We have to be ambassadors for this change that we're talking about. And don't try to make it big. It's, it's not what you're suggesting. They met for coffee. Mm -hmm. You know, we met for some glazed donuts and some water for whatever we had over. <laughs> Okay, and, and we, we did it. We did it. I'm so happy. I'm not trying to close. So is that a, is that a good is that a, I'm waiting on you? Well, I'm saying, is that, is that a good rap? That's a good rap. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Oh, I, want, I did want to say that I have a book coming out in uh, January of next year. It's called. Um, well, we have a book out now called <clears throat> Timeless, but I have my own book that's coming out, uh, which is called Personal Vision, and it's coming out in January of this uh, coming year, 2017. Oh, and uh, Romare Bearden and Gordon Parks have written about my work in that book. But it's a book of black and white photography. One of the biggest things that's happening this year is there's a museum oh, my goodness. opening in DC, Smithsonian. Yes. You got some of my work. Actually, we and we are history. well represented yes. yeah. in the opening. Yeah. It's yeah. September 24th. Yeah. And final comments I would like to recognize Dr. Schultz and the Arts and Science Center for inviting us and partnering with them. Let's give Dr. Schultz a big round of applause. And then, Maria, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the people in the audience. Uh, Professor Emeritus Henry Linton, who served 46 plus years for the department and the chairman. Uh, AJ and Marjorie Smith, they are located over here at DLR. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Professor Johnson and all the guests and all the students and teachers, thank you for coming. I've enjoyed it. It's been a, a grand occasion for us here in Pine Bluff, and we are looking forward to engaging with you in the near future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.